Last week, I travelled to Washington to interview author, journalist and public intellectual Christopher Hitchens. The interview's in two parts. We'll screen it over the next two nights. Hitchens was diagnosed with cancer earlier this year while on tour promoting his memoir, Hitch 22. Tonight's interview deals with how he responded to the illness and whether facing death has softened his fierce atheism or caused him to modify his belief that religion poisons everything. Here's the first of our two-part special. It's very good to see you. Tony, nice of you to come to DC. It's a pleasure to be here, and it, although the circumstances aren't great, and the question that most people are going to want to know is how are you at the moment? How are you feeling? If this had been yesterday, I was wondering, in fact, yesterday, if I could do this today. Um, that's because I've just had a kilo cure dose of um, venom cocktail mainlined into me, and in the first few days after that, you feel very uh, compromised, um, very nauseated, very weak, um, very demoralized. And that's on top of knowing why you have to have it, which is I have a tumor in my esophagus, which has spread. Um, so it's called stage four. Um, the thing about stage four is there is no stage five. So I'm finding out how this can be managed, whether I can live with it, whether it can be, it's, I doubt curable. I think the word curable doesn't really apply, but it can be treatable. What kind of life and how much of it I have is my big preoccupation now. Are the treatments working? Do you know? Well, the tumors were shrinking um, with the first round. But they've stopped doing that. They're having to try something a bit stronger now. And I, I may be a candidate for uh, radiation therapy, which is a very tough thing. You've got to be quite strong for it. I have quite a decent constitution in spite of all my um, abuse of it um, and my advanced years. I'm, I'm still quite robust. But the we wouldn't, we wouldn't, we wouldn't of, say uh, advanced years. Chemo, chemo, well, I'm in my 60s now. I finally look it. I think people until I was 60 would always say they thought I looked younger, um, which I think without flattering myself, I, I did. But I think I, I certainly have, as George Orwell says, people do after a certain age, the face they deserve. So are you actually up for a, a long interview about life, death, the universe and everything? Oh, yes. I mean, my interest in all the large questions hasn't dimmed at all. In fact, it's quite a good way of concentrating the mind. You've talked and you've, you've written um, about the cancer right from the beginning, and people have been following uh, your account uh, as you put out your monthly pieces in Vanity Fair. And you've talked about crossing a border uh, into the land of malady. What is that like? Well, for me personally, it was a bit like being deported in that I woke up in New York, having gone to bed feeling more or less OK during a very grueling book tour, and I woke in the morning thinking I was actually dying. The whole liquid sac, the pericardium, as it's called, around my heart had just filled up. It was as if my whole chest cavity had been crammed with wet cement. I couldn't move, I couldn't breathe. And I managed to call the emergency services, and these wonderful New Yorkers arrived, but so, so very heavily armed with sort of cuffs and torches and. Uh, Boots, And I remember thinking idly as they loaded me into the ambulance, you know, why do they need all this for one stricken civilian? It was a bit like being arrested and deported. And in fact, in their kindly way, they were escorting me across the frontier from the land of the well into the land of the, of the, very, the very ill indeed. And, well, it's not a transition you can ever forget making. And of course, it's not one you can ever fully make back again either. I mean, however, however well I respond to treatment, I'll never be able to feel the way I did the day before. What does it actually mean for your day-to-day -day life? Because we, we see you continually out there writing, doing interviews like this, uh, taking on, as you said, lectures, debates. I mean, how hard is it to actually get yourself out of bed in the morning to continue the life of a public intellectual? Well, I don't get out of bed much before 11 these days, and I go to bed much earlier than I did. So I can do about half, I suppose, of what I was doing before. I can 
I can continue to write as well. That's my big test. There were a couple of days when I was afraid I wasn't going to be able to write. And that terrified me very much because being a writer is what I am rather than what I do. It's my, without sounding, I hope, too affected, it's, it is my raison d'etre. And as well as being terrified of the thought that I wouldn't be able to, to do what I'm supposed to do, it, I was afraid that it would diminish my will to live. I mean, what would I be doing if I couldn't write? But that, fortunately, um, hasn't proved to be the case. And I, can, I can read any day, and I still read a lot. And I can write any day, but much more slowly and, and fewer words. Being a writer, you actually personified or personalised the, the cancer. You call it a, a blind, emotionless being. Um, you know, that is a pathetic fallacy. You've acknowledged that yeah. yourself. But um, does it feel like that, that you've been invaded by something? Well, obviously, it can't have emotions, um, and as far as we know, it can't see. It is a being. The thing is, it, it can't have a life of its own. But it is an alien, and it is, uh, it, it is alive as long as I am. Its only purpose is to kill me. It's a self-destructive alien. It's like the absolute negation, I suppose, of being pregnant, having something living inside you that is entirely malevolent and that wishes for your, doesn't wish for, but want, is purposed to encompass your death. And keeping company with this is, is a great preoccupation. Once you think about it like that, it's hard to unthink it. How do you feel about the, uh, the people who are praying for you? Because the, there are some, there are some who are praying for you to go to hell. There are some, yes. many more, in fact, who are praying for you to be cured and some who are praying for you to be converted. That's right, or converted and cured, um, to be fair to them. Um, well, so the people who pray for me to not only have an agonizing death, but then be reborn to have an agonizing and horrible eternal life of torture, I say, well, good on you. Um, see you there, um, sort of thing. To the, I don't feel I'm very much obliged to engage with them. For the people who ostensibly wish me well or are worried about my immortal soul, I, I say I take it kindly. I mean, it, it's, a, it's a show of concern. It's a show of solidarity, which is a very important word to me. It, it's, um, it's a kindness. It, if it doesn't do any good, and I'm sure it doesn't, it doesn't really do any harm. The only objection I have is one I touched on a moment ago, which is it seems to me a bit crass to be trying to talk to people about conversion when you know they're ill. The whole idea of hovering over a sick person who's worried and perhaps in discomfort and saying now's the time to reconsider strikes me as opportunist at the very best and has a very bad history in the past. There have been false claims made by people who you know, bothered Thomas Paine while he was dying or, um, and published false reports later that he'd recanted on his deathbed. Even tried that on Charles Darwin. It was an attempt at a, a false story of that kind. This, I think, is shameful, and to the extent that it reminds me of that, I resent it. The New York Times uh, says your illness has actually spurred one of the most heated discussions that they can remember of belief, religion, and immortality. Um, it's almost inevitable, isn't it, uh, when a, a famous atheist uh, faces uh, death, that this will happen? Yes. Yes, it's an, it's an occasion, and people... Um, never tire of saying when they, as they do, many people write to me or email me, including perfect strangers, readers, well-wishers, sometimes former students or people who know me a little bit. They all, one way or another, make the point that, okay, I won't pray for you, don't worry, or perhaps you don't mind if I do. They all do it as if they're doing it for the first time. It's rather touching. Um, but as I say, the arguments about immortality, <clears throat> the supernatural, uh, the last things, death, judgment, heaven and hell, are or are not valid quite independently of my mental or physical state. And so there's something fishy to me in the suggestion that, OK, now that your system is breaking down, wouldn't it be a good moment for you to um, repudiate the convictions of a lifetime? Again, there's something about the underlying assumption there that I I want to resist. More than 20 years ago, you mentioned Thomas Paine, but more than 20 years ago, uh, the Oxford 
philosopher A.J. Iyer uh, wrote about uh, being drawn to a red light when he'd had a near-death experience, and that was interpreted uh, by a lot of people as a suggestion that it actually changed his views of yeah. a lifetime. Are, are you worried this kind of thing could happen to you? There are two great, um, well, uh, Freddie Ayer is dead now. Um, he died not long after that. But there have been in the recent past two great humanists um, and atheist thinkers, himself and Professor Daniel Dennett, who've come very, very close to death and in a semi-conscious state, enough to allow them to speculate about consciousness independent of the brain and other things that fascinate all of us. But both of their conclusive essays on, on this matter are in my collection, um, The Portable Atheist, because they both, having undergone, so to say, that test, uh, came out with their convictions unaltered. Not entirely unaltered in Ayer's case. I mean, he did conclude the experience weakened his conviction that death would be the end of him. So uh, he, he had a, not, not a conversion, but at least a doubt thrown yes. in about his uh, pure atheism. Well, we can't say any more than we can say there is no God, that there is no afterlife. We can only say there is no persuasive evidence for or argument for it. Um, but I think I'd be much more willing to say there's no evidence at all that any human being can tell you how you qualify or what's meant by seeing some bright light at the end of the tunnel or coming towards you. Or that if you'll only make the right propitiation or right incantation or join the right church, they can tell you about how things will be after you're dead. I'm quite sure there's no human agency that can do that. I like surprises. Um, if there's to be a, a second look around with them, um, somehow not me and not my brain, but some kind of consciousness, well, that would be more fascinating than many days I've spent in real life. It's, it would indeed. This, these debates have been going on for centuries, though, and uh, yes, I, mean, you, you I think will quote, persist. You quote Blaise Pascal, um, who talked about a wager that could be made uh, we, we're with a, a God that would actually allow you at the very last minute to make a deal with him, to yes. believe for a brief period. Um, and that wager would be, that what have you got to lose? Well, it's rightly called a wager because there's something rather hucksterish about it. And I'm not a Christian, um, let alone a Roman Catholic Christian, as Pascal was. And I'm also not a theorist of probability, as he was. He was a great mathematician. But I say Huxterish for this reason. His wager assumes two things. One, a very cynical um, and credulous God. In other words, a God who would say, well, I can see your mind working, and I know that you're wagering on me because what have you got to lose? So naturally, I'll reward you if you say you believe in me. I mean, why does that follow? Why wouldn't you think that's not a very good reason. It's not very good reasoning. It's not a very good motive. You might just as well be a god. In fact, you should perhaps prefer to be a god who would say, actually, I have more respect for the person who couldn't bring himself to believe and certainly wouldn't claim to do so in the hope of getting a favour. Yes, uh, that, we're, we're talking now logic and, of course, a jealous Well, not just god. logic. I think there's a moral change to this. Well, well, exactly, the, because there, there's an argument that the jealous god who, who would consign non-believers to hell is actually immoral, so why would you follow him anyway? There's actually a Sufi prayer from the Middle Ages that is addressed to the Creator and says, Master, or however these things are addressed, and, um, if I um, pray to you in the hope of uh, getting heaven for myself, you should deny it to me. And if I pray for you only in the fear of hell, you should send me there. Um, these would be bogus forms of belief. They'd be simply behaviorist, reward and punishment stuff, conditioned animal reflexes, um, coercive, and they'd require a slave mentality, which is my second objection to the Pascal wager. It, it demands of us that we think of this God as <clears throat> a cynical, rather credulous, rather capricious opportunist, easily flattered, and of ourselves as the raw material for a pretty cruel and meaningless experiment.